Okay. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to present uh, <clears throat> an overview of the Southern Everglades um, phosphorus levels for the last five years. Um, I presented this last week at RAC also and in keeping with the last couple of years showing uh, <clears throat> a moving window of how phosphorus levels in the southern Everglades are improving all the way from um, the EAA moving all the way down to uh, Everglades National Park. So to start off with, um, <clears throat> as I go through the presentation, what I'd like to do first is I'd like to give you an overview of what the mandates are, uh, the requirements to achieve certain phosphorus levels that are required either by state law or under the consent decree, the federal consent decree, which has two parts. And then I'll start showing you um, <clears throat> how the state projects and implementing the BMP program and the EAA and uh, progress being made with um, decreasing the phosphorus levels through the stormwater treatment areas, how that is improving the discharges coming into the Everglades protection area, what the response is in the Everglades marsh, and then how that water flows south through water conservation area 3A into Everglades National Park, what we're seeing in those discharge phosphorus levels and also the response within Everglades National Park. So <clears throat> um, under the uh, STA discharges to the EPA, originally the design for the STAs was that they would achieve uh, 50 parts per billion. So that was the original intent um, with the restoration strategies that came out of uh, the agreement with US EPA, between US EPA and DEP to put in place new MPDS permits that would have a limit known as a water quality based effluent limit. That discharge level was lowered from 50 parts per billion to 13 parts per billion. <clears throat> um, so in order for those facilities um, to improve phosphorus levels, the, the point about getting to those discharge levels is that those facilities and the upstream control program are not causing or contributing to violations of state water quality standards namely the phosphorus levels that are in the downstream receiving areas of the Everglades protection area. So there's two operating um, mandates that we have to adhere to for the phosphorus levels. <clears throat> the first one is related to the consent decree, which has two parts. Appendix A is related to uh, the discharges into <clears throat> Everglades National Park through Shark River Slough or through Taylor Slough in the coastal basins. Those, that mandate requires that on an annual basis, there's a moving number. It's never the same number each year in which the limits um, have to be attained. It's a range of numbers between 7.6 and 12.8, and that's dependent on what the discharges are for that year. So if you have higher discharges, the limit tends down towards 7.6 parts per billion. If you have a lower discharge year, the limit is tending towards the upper range, which is 12.8 parts per billion. For Taylor Slough, it's a fixed number. It's fixed at 11 parts per billion. Within the refuge, it's, um, <clears throat> while it's a discharge limit down into the park, for the refuge, it's a marsh test, and that marsh test varies month to month. The level is never the same one month to the next. It varies between 7.2 to 17.6 parts per billion, and that is dependent on what the monthly water levels are within the refuge that dictates what the limit will be for that month. Under Everglades Forever Act and the establishment of the phosphorus criterion for the water conservation areas, <clears throat> the um, criterion was established to be 10 parts per billion, and that is done through uh, uh, four-part tests, which is both annual and over the course of uh, five years. Okay, so high level, <clears throat> what we're seeing from all of the data uh, put together over the last five years. What this graphic is showing you is the progress that's being made in the discharges, how much water is moving south over the last five years, what the concentrations are in those discharges as, as they move south, and what the response is in the system. And you'll see more detail on all of these components as I go through the slides later on. Um, first focusing on the discharges that have been coming out of the lake in the last five years, about 750,000 acre feet on average. This represents, um, of this volume, we've been sending on average almost 40% of that volume of water has gone directly to the STAs for treatment and then movement farther south into the Everglades protection area. And um, just as a contrast also, in the last five years, compared to the previous five year period, which was from 2009 to 2013, this amount of volume that's being sent to the STAs is actually a 400% increase in this last five years compared to the previous five years. 
So the discharges coming out of the lake with that volume of water have been averaging 140 parts per billion. <clears throat> as, the, as that water goes through the EAA, that percentage of water that's going to keep on moving on to the S STAs, <clears throat> excuse me, it mixes with um, the STA, I'm sorry, with the EAA discharges, which is the predominant volume of water that the STAs are, are treating. So you can see here of the percentage of um, what the STAs are treating, a little more than 22% of the inflow volume that's being treated is from Lake Okeechobee and the remainder is from the EAA. So as that water is mixing, we're seeing an average concentration of 130 parts per billion, about 1.3 million acre feet on average moving into the STAs. As the uh, treatment facilities are discharging, we're seeing in aggregate across all of the STAs an average of 23 parts per billion. And then the response in the system is, it's 10 parts per billion is the goal within each of the water conservation areas. So within the refuge, water conservation area one, we're seeing nine parts per billion on average in the monitoring network there. Water conservation area two is at 10. And then uh, the best numbers we're seeing is south in water conservation area 3A, where we're averaging six. So as that water is moving south through water conservation area 3A, and it gets down to the border of Everglades National Park, not all of that water is uh, able to get through water conservation area 3A to go through the southern end because there's constraints there, but um, it's a little less than one million acre feet on average has gone into, into Shark River Slough. And we show nine parts per billion, but the range has been between, um, on average, the last five years. It's a very specific number that's required as uh, computing for the limits for Everglades National Park. And so we've been actually averaging about 8.6 parts per billion, but we show it as an average here of nine. Um, down in Taylor Slough, it's a little under 300,000 acre feet on average coming into Taylor Slough or through the coastal basin um, gaps into the Panhandle area of Everglades National Park. The concentrations coming in for these discharges has actually averaged about 6.5 parts per billion. We've rounded it to seven. And then um, the entire monitoring network within Everglades National Park is showing an average of four parts per billion. The concentration is a little bit higher up here, seven, eight parts per billion. But as you get down towards the southern end of Shark River Slough and into Taylor Slough, uh, you're seeing two, three, four parts per billion, which I'll show you later on. But overall, big picture wise, the monitoring network for the area that it covers is showing that we're 90% of the Everglades is remaining uh, at or below 10 parts per billion. Okay, so the next couple of slides I'll go through quickly, but it deserves some explanation because um, what we see performance wise in the STAs and the response in the system, it does have uh, the hydro, the Rainfall patterns and uh, how it drives hydrology has an influence on phosphorus concentrations. So we know that in water year 2017, it was very dry. As we got into water year 2018, it was very wet, a very wet, uh, wet season, which brought in record-setting rainfall uh, since 1932, almost 52 inches of rainfall. And that came from uh, three events mainly. The first one was the June event that was Tropical storm Beatrice that brought in uh, huge amounts of rainfall. Then it, we had Hurricane Irma in September, and then that was followed by another tropical storm which came in October. So the system is responding, uh, the water management system is responding to where the rainfall occurs throughout the system. And these panes, let's just show you in these three rainfall events uh, where the more significant amount of rainfall is actually falling geographically. So you can see from the first rainfall event in June, that was mostly uh, very high rainfall in the two to 300 percent range that fell south of Lake Okeechobee. That's important to note because that is when the water conservation area started filling up. And the ability to be able to send water south is really highly dependent on the infrastructure that is uh, south of Lake Okeechobee going all the way down to Everglades National Park. Um, the September rainfall from Hurricane Irma further exacerbated the high levels uh, in the EAA region. And uh, as we got into October, that was mostly uh, centered in uh, the central part of the district. The next couple of slides, I'm not going to cover these in detail. Um, basically what they're doing is they're just they're contrasting what the requirements under the consent decree versus what was enacted in uh, state law in Chapter 373-4592. So um, basically under the Everglades Forever Act, which is codifying 
parts of the consent decree, but also expanding what the requirements are under state law for additional um, uh, areas to cover for protection and also for treatment facilities. There's definitely more that's being done under uh, state law. On this slide, um, I think what's important to note here is under the federal consent decree, the one thing that um, is really a driver of um, the consent decree is water quality, phosphorus specifically, and that's to improve the phosphorus levels into the refuge and into Everglades National Park so that there's not an imbalance in flora and fauna. So attaining those requisite levels is what the federal consent decree is centered on. So under um, Everglades Forever Act, there's a lot more areas. It covers um, more uh, the entire Everglades protection area. And it's also important to note that quantity, timing, and distribution are important. So it's quality. We need to improve that. But we also need to make sure that the quantity, timing, and distribution component is working because both of those, they should not be mutually exclusive. They need to work together in, in order to be able to ensure that quality continues to improve. Um, the, I think the takeaway from this one is mainly that the MPDS Q-bells are, are now a lot more stringent than they were originally envisioned under the consent decree and what was enacted in the original permits. 50 parts per billion was the original. So we have very stringent limits that are in place that are being uh, operated under US EPA approved MPDS permits. All right, so as I go through um, the next couple of slides, let me explain what this high level one is that um, the next series of slides are going to show by each flow path how phosphorus levels are improving. So in the uh, eastern flow path, this is treated by STA 1 east and 1 west. The central flow path is um, treated through STA 2 when it goes into water conservation area 2A and also um, part of the central flow path that goes through STA 3 4 is going into 3A coupled with the western flow path which is being treated through 5 6. So as I go through the graphics, you'll see um, what these flow path improvements have been. Um, there are features that are, there are a number of features that are already constructed. Uh, the L8 FEB, that one has been completed, so we're going through in the next one to two years of operating that facility so that we could get that requisite storage um, capability prior to discharging into the SDAs to meter the water so we get better performance through the STAs. Uh, the expansion areas, what, one west is, um, that one is being flooded, and then the, uh, it's pretty much just started with STA 1 West phase. This is phase one, and this is phase two for the expansion. So as these come online, we're going to see improved water quality coming out of STA 1 West. A1 FEB has been online for a very long time. This is the best performing STA. Uh, STA 5.6 still needs the FEB constructed <coughs> in the C-139 area, but there is earthwork that's ongoing within that STA to improve the efficiency. So in aggregate, I was talking about the state um, programs that are to improve phosphorus levels. So we have both the BMP program and the stormwater treatment areas. So in water year 2018, you've heard it, you had the results um, previously that was announced 66% reduction. State law requires that there's a minimum of 25% reduction in the BMP program. The STAs for water year 2018, uh, 36 parts per billion, it did go up. This is about twice what it was last year. Uh, because there's, we had, I showed you in the rainfall patterns and um, the, with the storms that came through, there were significant impacts that we had um, within the STA. So that was, that had something to do with the performance, but also transitioning from a very dry into a wet period. We know that when you transition that way, that water levels um, play a significant part in going from dry to, dry to wet, that you have release of phosphorus. So there's an element of that that's, uh, in, that is part of the reason why these numbers are a little higher. So um, just a number of the projects so far that we've implemented or that are uh, under construction or initiated through restoration strategies in order to be able to attain the Q-Bell to get the requisite 13 parts per billion uh, through 2024, 2025 when all of these features are in place um, should be seeing the STAs performing down at that level. All right, the EA BMP program, like I mentioned, 66 percent. So it's been averaging actually uh, about 54 percent over its entire lifespan of that program has been implemented, which is more than twice required by law. 
And so far, there's been about almost 3,800 metric tons of phosphorus has been prevented from leaving the EAA through the implementation of that program over time. What this graphic is showing is the inflow, the inflow concentrations in red going into all of the STAs. So um, this is the aggregate of inflow concentrations, the aggregate inflow volume, and then in aggregate what the uh, treated levels are coming out of the STAs. So um, in this past year, you can see that the inflow concentrations coming into the SDAs have, have been um, the second highest since 1995. We had 186 before. It's at 180 parts per billion um, coming in. So the outflow at 36 part per billion, and there was a lot of uh, water obviously flowing into the STAs. I believe the STAs treated about 1.6 million acre feet in water year 2018. Um, what we've been wanting to see is at least an 80 percent reduction in phosphorus levels between when they come in and they exit the STAs. So even in this year that we had high inflow concentrations and the low outflow uh, and the higher outflow, we still achieved an aggregate an 80% reduction or more than that uh, in total through the STAs. This table up here is important to note. This is a requirement every year in July uh, under our consent orders that um, we have with DEP uh, and that US EPA is looking at to see what each five-year moving window looks like in order to, um, what does it look like as we're continuing to build these projects and getting towards attaining the Q-Bell. So each year, July, we have to present what these numbers are. So I'm showing them up on here for you. And you can see that there's been a trajectory. We've been generally, over the last five years, been going lower in all of the STAs. It did spike up in what year 2018. The really important thing to note is that STA 3.4, the best performing one, in the last three years, we've had numbers that are coming out less than 13 parts per billion. And STA 3.4, that one in particular, is really important to remember that that is a major pathway for treating the water coming into Water Conservation Area 3A, which has an influence, the upstream control program um, going through the STAs and also how water is sent south and what those mechanisms are, those two in tandem are very important for how the levels in water in the inflows to Shark River Slough um, are able to attain their requisite requirements. So historically, what these two maps are showing is that water quality in a baseline period, you can see all the really very, there's a preponderance of these red dots uh, throughout the water conservation areas and the size of the dot, the bigger it is, the higher the concentration. So the only place where you're really seeing the lower concentrations where it's 10 parts per billion or lower is in the southern 3A and southern 2A. Where we are now, it's a stark contrast. We've made, I said before, 90% of uh, the water conservation areas plus Everglades National Park. We're at 90% at least where it's at 10 parts per billion or lower. So you see a lot of green uh, monitoring stations. The places where we still have um, the red dots where they're not as elevated, they're usually in the uh, teens or in the 20s, is in close proximity to the discharges to the STAs or where they're in areas that are prone to be dry and when they transition into, did you want to say something, Mr. Okay, sorry. Um, in areas where they're dry and they're gonna transition into a wet season and we still see some phosphorus release that occurs in those areas. Okay, so the next three slides. Um, these represent the flow path improvement from the eastern, the central, and the western flow paths. So focusing first on the flow path that is being treated, it's the BMP program plus the improvements uh, being attained through the STA, one east, one west. Historically, we saw 183 parts per billion during a baseline 84% reduction. And in the last five years, we've been at 30 parts per billion. What we want to start seeing in this flow path is that the variability diminishes. We want to start seeing a, a tighter pattern. We actually saw that in the previous three years. And then, as I mentioned, um, we had a, a, uh, the levels increased a bit in uh, water year 2018. In the central flow path, which is going through STA 2 into water conservation area 2A, Average concentration is a little above 100 parts per billion historically, more than an 80% reduction. This is what I mentioned. We want to see this low variability 
in the discharges coming through the STA. And STA2 is assisted with A1 FEB, so that is primarily in metering that water into STA2 that way. It's been very helpful to be able to ensure that the phosphorus levels stay low and that that variability in the outflows remains very tight. You can see in water year 2018 that uh, the levels were elevated. On the western flow path, uh, we also, um, well, 126 parts per billion average, more than 80% reduction. We're also seeing the same um, tight pattern on the variability. That most of this tightness and the variability and the low concentrations is because of the influence, the major influence from SDA 3.4. It's treating the majority of the water that's coming in from um, the, like the western part of the central flow path. And um, in, when that's contrasted with, there still needs to be better imp improvement from SDA 5.6. But you can see that based on SDA 3.4 and its operations with FEB, a1 FEB, we're seeing very low levels, and um, with a bit of the spike coming in in this past year. All right, so how is, based on those flow paths, how are each of the water conservation areas responding to the uh, decrease in phosphorus levels? So um, in the last five years, we're seeing almost 80% of the monitoring stations. There's 24 of them in uh, water conservation area one. Of those 24 stations, we're seeing an average of nine parts per billion. Um, and let me orient you to the slide a little bit also because I've got two boxes on here and there are two mandates in water conservation area one. One is the phosphorus rule, which is a 10 parts per billion. And then for the interior marsh area, it is a federal consent decree under Appendix B, which actually has a long-term goal of seven parts per billion. So this blue box is going with the 24 stations, and this greener box is going with what the interior marsh uh, levels are under Appendix B. So um, we, one of the things that we also want to see is not only is it below 10 parts per billion and that we're attaining the interior marsh uh, concentration levels under the consent decree is that we start seeing the red dots transition into green dots. We had a couple of those. We had three of them in the previous five-year period. We didn't see any transition in this year, but we're still seeing really good water quality, despite the fact that STA 1 West and 1 East were elevated in water year 2018. We still saw very good concentrations across the board, no significant change within the response in, in the area. And then the one thing um, that I'll leave you also is that with the consent decree, that since that only applies to the interior marsh, the phosphorus rule applies to the entire marsh and in that sense is um, more protective of the entire marsh as opposed to just what the consent decree is doing. And the fact that we have achieved what the long-term goal is within the seven, we obviously do still have a little more needs in the perimeter stations uh, under that more protective requirement of the state's phosphorus rule that we need to improve those levels. Um, what I'll do here is I'll try not to spend too much time, but I think this is important to note about what the federal consent decree requires. Um, I mentioned before that the levels that we have to comply with, they vary month to month. So what this graphic is doing, it's giving an overall impression of how well the interior marsh is doing it, um, commensurate to what the requirements are under the Appendix B. So the long-term level actually came into effect for the federal consent decree uh, in January of 2007. So if we have a monthly value that is below the requirement under Appendix B, that the, sorry. Sorry, could we have someone go check on that, that background noise, please? I'm sorry, Stuart. Okay. Like to continue, maybe speak up a little bit. I will do that. Okay. Thank you. So, um, in in a particular month, if the actual observed concentration is below what the level is under Appendix B for that month, the dots are colored blue. If the monthly value is above the requirement for the consent decree, they're they're colored red. So, what you can see with this time series is 93% of the data is below what the requirement is on a month-to-month -month basis. And it's been averaging, not only is it below, but it's on average three parts below 
what the levels are required for that entire uh, time for that entire time since 2007. We have had um, seven instances in which the months have been greater than the limit for that month. In order to have a exceedance, you have to have two months in a 12-month period, so there were only two of those that occurred. But you can see by looking at the graphic that it was very small deviations or just very small levels above those monthly values, where if you look at them all in concert, it's less than one part per billion over. So 93% of the months at an average of three parts per billion below what the consent decree requires with only um, those four instances where we had two exceedances that are averaging one part per billion. And as I mentioned before, attaining the seven part per billion interior marsh concentration, we're at that point now. Moving on to area two, this has a state phosphorus requirement and contrasting between the last five years and where we have been uh, currently in this year is the last five years, about 70% of the stations below 10 parts per billion. We did have two stations transition from red to green. That's great news. And um, in, this, in this past year, we did see some elevated concentrations in the very northwest part of Water Conservation Area 2A. But what you can notice is that this is the story. S when the discharges are coming out of STA2, um, there could be a little bit of impact with the close proximity of those stations, but we also transitioned in water year 2017 into water year 2018 from dry to wet. So these areas were dry, and upon reflooding, there is a phosphorus release mechanism that's going on within that area that is having an influence on these numbers. So you can see, based from the previous two years where they're in the 20s and then we went into the 30s, you can also see that here just south of where the uh, S10 structures are that are operated by the core. They're bringing water from the refuge into area 2A. These numbers are in the teens, um, whereas over here they were in the 20s. So in some places we see elevation, in other places we see an improvement, and that is largely dependent on the way the water levels fluctuate within those areas. Um, 10 parts per billion on average the last five years, and we, because we had these two sites, just those two sites, are influencing the number for this one year within uh, two A to be at 11 parts per billion. Moving down at the three A, as I mentioned, this is where we see the best water quality in the marsh, especially on the southern end. We're seeing lots of fours and fives. Um, on average, for the last five years, we saw six parts per billion across this monitoring network. We had several stations that transitioned in water year 2014 from red to green. Uh, in this past year, water year 2018, we're still seeing above 80% of the stations are at or below 10 parts per billion with an average of seven parts per billion. And um, as I mentioned, in the northern part, uh, typically in the last five years, we had two sites where the, uh, the concentrations were above 10 parts per billion. Here we had one more that we picked up in the northwest. But again, that is, that is uh, highly dependent on this area being dry and then when it becomes rewetted, you see the elevated concentrations, and that's just an influence that occurs um, that uh, until we get the hydrology from the quantity, timing, and distribution to be able to meter the water out, these levels, even though the phosphorus levels through the STAs are getting down to 13 parts per billion, this naturally occurring condition of wetting and uh, re dry re-wetting uh, will be persistent for a while. All right, so now I'm going to move down into Everglades National Park. So you've seen improving phosphorus levels through the, through the SDAs. Um, each of the flow paths are coming down. We're seeing great response within the marsh uh, water conservation areas, one, two, three. And then as that water is moving south through water conservation area 3A, it's coming um, either into Shark River Slough or the water can be routed around uh, through the L29, through the S334 structure, down the... Um, L, the uh, L31N canal down to C111, and as that water gets down in this area, it will go through some discharge structures and go into Taylor Slough or further down into S18C and get into the Panhandle area, what we call the coastal basins. So this water quality in this area has been very low for a very long period of time. The requirement under the Appendix uh, A, Appendix A has two parts, Shark River Slough, Taylor Slough. 
So under Taylor Slough Coastal Basins, it's a fixed limit of 11 parts per billion. The last five years, we've been averaging 5.2 parts per billion. The goal of Appendix A for this area is that you achieve a long-term average concentration of six parts per billion. So we're at, we're at that level for this area. I'm going to move back up north and now look at Shark River Slough. So Shark River Slough is not a fixed limit. I mentioned before that it's a variable limit. Each year the limit is recomputed based on the amount of discharge that goes into Shark River Slough. So the black line represents what that variable limit is each year. Um, the dots represent what the overall concentration is that's going through the S12s, the S333 structure, and what makes it into either the shark western side of Shark River Slough or the eastern side of Shark River Slough. Um, the long-term levels came into effect also in 2007, so we track this on an annual basis. Um, what the goal of the consent decree is that on a long-term basis you want to get down towards eight parts per billion, so even though the consent decree doesn't have a way of actually specifying a period of record that you track what that uh, uh, progress towards attaining that goal, we do that ourselves by measuring what the last five years of the observed concentrations are, which have hovered about 8.6 parts per billion. And if you compare that against what the last five years are of this annually varying limit, the limit has averaged in the last five years at 8.9. So we're staying below, the, the observed concentrations are staying below what the long-term limit is for this area. Now. Um, what I do want to mention also is focus on what the red dots represent. So any year in which we have an annual observed concentration uh, that is greater than the limit computed for that year, that's known, that uh, constitutes an exceedance. And the body that was formed under the consent decree uh, that's known as a technical oversight committee, that committee comprised of five uh, agency representatives from each of the parties that settled the settlement agreement. They determine uh, through looking at all the information, hydrology and the, the way water moved, uh, operations, what, what might have contributed to that exceedance. They only have two conditions in which they can determine that it's not an exceedance. It is whether it is a data error or whether or not it is a natural extraordinary phenomenon. There are no other considerations that they're allowed to take into account that would deem that exceedance not to be a violation. So if you don't pass that, those two conditions, the exceedance is considered technically a violation. So out of the four years in which there were exceedances, 2008 was considered a data error. 2017, that's when we had Hurricane Irma that came through. Um, and that one was determined to be uh, due to natural extraordinary phenomena. But the two in between, 2012 and 2014, those conditions did not prevail. And actually what did prevail in the evidence that was presented to the TOC is something that is also being uh, discussed in parallel in the federal projects in either SEP or in the water control plans like COP, is that there are operational conditions which um, dictate uh, the movement of water and what the influence is on dry versus wet and what it's what the influence is on the concentrations of the phosphorus going into Shark River Slough. So both in 2012 and 2014 it looked like those elements were in play um, where you have um, there there are conditions that are going on that are really outside the purview of the of the um, consent decree and the technical oversight committee to be able to make any judgments on. But when you look at all four of these together, uh, the average difference of being over the limit, it's averaged to less than a part per billion. And I think the most important part, I'll go, I'll go back to this, the salient point is that the levels are staying very low. There's not really a lot of variation in the data. Um, it is staying well below 10 parts per billion. It is pretty close to the eight parts per billion required by the consent decree. And looking at the averages compared to what that variable limit is, the water quality is really good going into the park. So then what's the response in the park itself? So if you look historically, um, within the stations that were monitoring the phosphorus levels within the park, um, there were still, there were quite a few stations that were at 10 parts per billion or lower, but it was less than 90% of the stations, averaging seven parts per billion. 
Where we have been in the last five years is that 100% of the stations are at 10 parts per billion or lower. And we saw the same thing in water year 2018. Um, I mentioned before in the very beginning that as uh, there is, there are varying levels in these concentrations. You do see that um, the consent decree requires you achieve eight parts per billion on a long-term basis, and that's also something that we look at in the marsh, that it's below that uh, going forward. So you can see all these levels are all below eight parts per billion. And for Taylor Slough, we want to make sure that they're below six parts per billion. So you see the threes and the fours that are in this area down here. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is that because the limits are applied at the inflows at Shark River Slough and in Taylor Slough, that's actually adopted in state water quality standards. So the monitoring network that's within the park, it's a default monitoring network that we use to just track progress and make sure that, so that we have an idea of how the inflows are influencing the downstream concentrations. Okay, so um, what I'd like to leave you here on this slide is um, we have a bit of a conundrum. So I've shown you through all the slides how phosphorus levels are improving from the state program uh, implementation of the BMPs and the STAs and what the response is within the marsh system across all the water conservation areas and also in Everglades National Park. So what we have come to understand through both the TOC process going back to 2010 and 11, uh, and through our cooperation, our cooperative efforts with our federal partners in uh, the either SEP or in water control plan updates like uh, ERTP, which is the first one we did that went into place in 2012, Everglades Restoration Transition Plan, Water Control Plan, and now we're working on the Combined Operations Plan, is that we started seeing a real signal that water levels play an important part in um, influencing what the concentrations are going into Shark River Slough. So what I mean by that is I'm going to contrast, and I believe Brian Accardo had mentioned this one in, uh, earlier, is that we want to see that the upstream control program brings, the water, brings those concentrations down. So those are the upstream inputs. Um, so that there's a so that the upstream inputs are not causing or contributing to violations of state water quality standards. And since Shark River Slough is a state water quality standard, I'll throw it in that boat. Um, under um, the original modified water deliveries project, there was the two-pronged assumption that you get the upstream under control, and then you couple that with downstream conveyance features that would achieve marsh-like flow, because there was a recognition that if you, if you move that water through a marsh-like system, it's going to improve the water quality. You stabilize the water levels by making sure that the quantity, timing, distribution does not influence where you have low water levels and you get higher phosphor concentrations that you can mitigate that. So while we have improved the upstream, as I've shown, we still have a downstream issue with moving forward with a number of these projects. So that does present a conundrum. Uh, I mean, not only is it a conundrum to all the federal and uh, agencies that are participating in Everglades restoration and to the South Florida Water Management District, but also presents a conundrum to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection because they're required under two statutes, two state statutes that the legislature um, basically says this is what you have to uh, conform to. The first one is 373.1502. There's a reasonable assurance clause that requires that DP issue permits only when there's a reasonable assurance that state water quality standards are not going to be violated. And then specifically for the Everglades under 373-4592, uh, DP is prohibited from issuing permits if water quality violations are going to occur. So that is, um, you know, our whole goal is to be able to get the quality right and get the quantity, timing, and distribution correct. And we don't want to be in a situation where they are mutually exclusive and fighting against each other. So in moving forward, this is, a, this is going to be somewhat of a, a dilemma for Everglades restoration, especially upon DEP and their ability to be able to issue permits for infrastructure that is being constructed and we need to be operated so that we can move the water south into the park. Um, so with that,
I, will, I would be remiss if I did not mention the incredible amount of work and effort and the talented staff that we have across the agency that um, spend countless hours acquiring all of this information and putting it together in this type of fashion so that I can stand up here and present it to you. It's going to be published all in the uh, 2019 environmental report, and um, so it's available for the public to be able to go and see all this information as well.